So this morning, this morning we have with us Guy Frost, a cataloger, I believe, at Valdosta State University. Thank you so much, Guy, for joining us this morning um, to talk to the Gill Users Group. Go right ahead. All right, thank you, Joy. One of the things that I wanted to really cover uh, is archival and special collections and how linked data and semantic web is beginning to change how we do things. And so I'm kind of giving you a little history about um, developments over the last few decades that I think will put some of this in perspective. Um, so we start off with standards for archival description. There are many tools of the trade uh, and in the early days, archives, personal papers and manuscripts or APPM and describing our archival content standards. Those are the two big ones. Uh, archives and personal papers um, has been superseded by DAX, which is uh, the other one. But um, the reason why these were developed or the reason why DAX was developed is because there was change needed because of the web, XML or EAD. And so in 2004, DAX appeared. Both APPM and DAX, so they were developed to replace chapter four of AACR2. Um, and it should be noted that they are MARC based. This is designed for a MARC environment. Um, a lot of the developments uh, continued or theory and thought and about changes, not necessarily in archival description, but in cataloging in general. And that emerged in 2012 with the resource description access. Everyone should know what that is. So this replaced AACR2, but it is still, the early version was still mark based uh, But there were differences and there was an eye toward a new non mark environment and the um, entity relationship type real database. Um, throughout these years, buzzwords continued to be emerged, linked data, semantic web, bib frame, RDF, triples, quads, graphs, and much more. Quads and graphs are the big one that started to uh, appear in the, next, the last couple of years. So because of that, resource description and access RDA needed to be revised yet again. And so they have done that. Uh, the 3R project were actually um, developed a new version of the RDA description and access they don't want to call it a RDA 2.0, but it really is. And so it was officially approved this past December in 2020. This is designed to be applied to RDAF built systems. And we'll talk about RDF a little bit more, but not too much. Uh, and so it's not MARC, but it's RDF. It's bib frame, in other words. So, um, let me go right back to this. I've underlined 2004 where DAX appeared. One year later, a journal article was published in 2005. Uh, the title was More Product, Less Process, the MPLP. Um, this really was a um, extremely important work because it addressed some of the issues that archives was having, not just in the US, but really globally. So cataloging is a function which is not working with the opening line of this article. And it was, and this article is 55 pages long. If you think about that, that's not the standard length for most articles. So it was a behemoth. Um, the article did focus on massive backlogs of inaccessible collections. Uh, this was probably one of the things that actually had to happen in order for archivists to get a hold of their backlog. And so some of the findings of this research is that archivists could not agree on what was important. More collections ingested than uh, descriptions created, couldn't keep up. So this was all based on uh, trying to do what these standards are telling you you need to do. But the hypothesis that they uh, put forth was that the archivists do too much that's not necessarily needed, it doesn't need to be done right away um, or every time or any time. So these are big changes, big changes. Um, I have included uh, in a link in the signature, uh, in the notes area, 
whenever you get the uh, PowerPoint. This is uh, to the quote where cataloging is a function which is not working, where the um, authors got that from. It's no longer available on the web, by the way. You have to go to the Internet Archive. Other findings. So this gives you kind of a better idea of just how bad off archives was at the time. A quarter half of holdings was uh, unprocessed in 1998 through their surveys. 34% more than half was not done or 60% or one third unprocessed in 2003, 2004. You can see that, you know, there are, that's a lot, that's a huge backlog. Um, as they said, tens of thousands of cubic feet had yet to be processed and made publicly available. In some instances, you could access them, but for many, you couldn't. And so I'm, I'm putting this also in perspective. Uh, many of you don't know who William F. Buckley Jr. is, but I encourage you to look him up. But his uh, official bibliographer told me that his collection is the length of three football fields. Now, imagine trying to get bibliographic control over something that large. So applying these traditional approaches to a new problem and many people are still unwilling to change. Uh, and so, but a lot of people did. And so the, um, the new standard is to do what's just good enough. So researchers and donors were not pleased. 51% of their survey said that. Uh, and it looks bad on the eyes of resource allocators, in other words, your administration. So this proposal wanted to expedite collections to users, provide just adequate enough description using minimal steps, sufficient for promoting the collections, aka good enough. And so many libraries did that, so many archives uh, followed this, these new procedures, and they pretty much eliminated their backlogs by doing so. There were other handouts and manuals that developed uh, that came out uh, and they basically said, do not go to fold level unless there is a compelling benefit to be derived from such detailed work. Do not go below series level. Do not even add series, do something else. Respect the organization imposed by the person who created the records and strive for simplicity. And so in other words, you wouldn't necessarily go through and, and put your own organizational uh, thought behind presenting it. Sometimes you have no choice, but when you don't, when you, when you do have a choice, you can just go by what the creator has done, how he's actually, or she's got it organized. But um, scholars have taken notice, not just that collections were not there, but that there is a difference. So Chaz Clifton blogged about one of VSU's collections um, and he has written a lengthy historical note. So here I've actually, I've taken the approach that this was um, important for people to discover. And so I, I wrote uh, the biography on Victor and Cora Anderson and a little bit on their religious faith fairy um, and how it all kind of came about. So it's something that scholars are also taking notice that, you know, so Chaz has actually donated at least four collection types. Uh, the one at Berkeley, you know, he gets said that they, he's beginning to think that they just really are not interested in processing it. Um, and that was his first collection. His second collection was um, another archive that's actually in uh, Delaware. Um, and it's there's concerns that have just surfaced in the last few days about it not um, existing anymore. So he's a little concerned about that. And then he gave us stuff um, and we actually did a lot of processing on his collection. So the finding aid, the finding aid is often substantial, multi-layered and descriptive. So this is philosophically, it's still the old practice. We describe the contents of the series or folders. We are assisting researchers coming to the archive. So I've underlined this for a reason. So keep this in mind as we go forward. But it provides something about its entire holdings when you actually provide the finding aid. 
the thing is that uh, MPLP is mentioned is that one sock shoe does not fit all. And so there are many instances where uh, you really don't need the detailed description. Uh, and so you just have to play it by ear uh, or take it one collection at a time. But APPM did push the finding aid to a new level of importance. And we were in ACR2 and Mark, it was the chief source of information. So without a full finding aid, it was thought that also cataloging was not possible. Uh, but MPLP changed that. So stub records could be good enough if it at least identified what researchers might be looking for. There are exceptions to the rule though that need to be made again. But there are some other developments. So what happens in the last 20 years? The question is, da, 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 da. smartphones. And so uh, they began to emerge uh, in the 2002-ish, but touchscreens were later, uh, 2000s to early 2010s. But this became a game changer for user expectations for information retrieval. And this is not just archival collections, this is across the board. Uh, we are, many libraries are moving to e-preferred because students want to sit at home and do all their research without coming into the physical building. Uh, so this is really important to keep in mind as well. Many users are discovering the existence of archival collections though through Google searching, such as archive space, RDA, BitFrame, uh, is also on the horizons. Archives Grid is uh, also um, in OCLC, but this is not updated on a regular basis. You can request that OCLC do a refresh for your holdings, but it's they don't have a regular schedule for that. Uh, so I learned. So technology continues to evolve as well as discovery mechanisms. And I'm assuming uh, that user expectations will continue to evolve as well. So in the next slide, what I want to do is kind of put this in a perspective. So these are recent activities based on my own archival collections. So user needs, uh, we had a webmaster for um, a religious leader, which I have his records now, and this does have item level descriptions. There's the economist or parliamentarian from New Delhi, India, writing a biography. This is also item level description. And researchers uh, on a brother of a collection we have, I have two items dealing with this brother. Also though, item level description. So all of these were fulfilled um, where we digitized the content and then gave it to the user. The, one that's semi-fulfilled. This is a collection I've been currently working on, but it's not quite finished. A scholar in the UK, uh, this is partial item level description, some full text in our institutional repository, but he learned about it from word of mouth. So um, another one that's not fulfilled is a documentary film director in New England has unprocessed reel to reels. Also, he learned about this from word of mouth. And so there's a kind of a difference um, in these in the 21st century or it, now with I think smartphones and user expectations are driving this. And, but so what do all of these have in common though is that, well, they are from a distance and expecting that service. So advances, uh, and technology coupled with systems that are on Google's side of the web, like Archon, ArchivesSpace, ArchivesGrid, which will bring new users to archives that expect or hope for services that do not require them uh, to visit in person. So rather, if they want the items digitized and sent here in their inbox. I know I've actually experienced this too, writing um, on my own research, because everything is actually in Portland, Oregon, and that's a little far away to travel. So uh, this is italicized because it is the name of a report, a research position paper by OCLC. So 
this is kind of um, where a lot of your stakeholders that provide databases like OCLC are looking at um, all the communities that they serve. And so this one is specific to archives and special collections who definitely have their own unique needs. So from this, I know that this slide is really packed, but I wanted to put all of it on one slide. So apologies. Um, Links data forces you to structure your data. This is significant. This is how BibFrame and RDF technologies are expected to run. So it's less free text notes, things that we used to put in 500 notes or general descriptions need to be coded fields and include the use of URIs. So it's, this is a, a shift, a shift from notes to entities. Um, and they should start to influence our descriptive practice and take the profession uh, toward data that wants to be structured. Major shift in mindset. Um, and it's not easy for anyone, including myself. Uh, potentially, for better discovery, there needs to be identity markers supporting user tasks. So if LRM concept of user tasks of finding uh, and identifying, and the last uh, is exploring. So demographic data, such as gender resistance, social groups, all of these uh, provide mechanisms, new mechanisms for discovery. Um, and we can include those in archival descriptions. Um, the inclusion of increased visibility of item specific information. And so there's a little bit of that supported in my own experience with my collections, that that item level uh, information provides additional keywords uh, that otherwise wouldn't be there. But there are also uh, for like rare books, the binder is, or the printer, those are significant things. If you want to know who produced blank, you know, uh, or X in a lie, uh, in the 1800s. So actually adding that uh, access point for the printer is significant. Um, end users will still need to adapt to changes, developers too, and I should probably all, uh, uh, people who work reference or service points, they're probably end users in this, but that should be emphasized that you are part of that group. Um, developers too, uh, this, this, again, this is coming from the Archives and Special Collections report. I threw in developers too, uh, because they too need to understand um, the importance of these so that the systems that they do produce uh, are actually giving us what we really need education barriers that is difficult to overcome, the trouble with triples. I mean, if you don't know what a triple is, then uh, I, I wanna say you're behind. You may not ever need to know what those are. We're gonna cover those a little bit anyways. Um, a lot of labor with little commitment to financing the labor. And this is the important thing is that you really have to have administration that backs up working and revising and updating content for uh, 21st century catalogs uh, and not the old mark or pre-mark data. This report does mention more product, less process and has set, they basically said it has set the golden medium, but work remains to reach out for, uh, it's out of, it's really it is because of staffing uh, reductions, it remains out of reach for most small and medium-sized archives. Shift in the mindset is also going to be an issue to think about how to structure archival descriptions natively using the tools and systems in place, such as archive space, and balance local versus global IDs. So I want to touch a little bit on what a global versus local ID is focusing just on local. So if I can migrate. So this is a hypothetical identifier for a local heading. So this is not doable right now, but this is what needs to be happening. And that's what that archive report from OCLC says needs to happen, is that um, we need to be able to harvest and manipulate uh, our local headings 
And part of that is done actually from a, a URI, a Uniform Resource Identifier. And so uh, archive, archive, I can't speak. Agricultural events is a uh, local archive space heading. So this identifier shows subjects, uh, it shows a little number, 1033. That number is your identifier, your URI for this specific subject. In MARC, I used a R690, it's actually a, our um, local heading, but you can see that that URI is placed in a subfield zero. And so um, that's where a lot of this is moving, uh, where we're actually going to not necessarily type in your agriculture events, but you'll actually use a pull down menu that will allow you to select local headings. And then from an alphabetical list, you would pick the uh, list, the heading that you need. And behind the scenes, it would be linking up to this um, identifier. So that's the idea behind that. Uh, I have next a visualization of what we really are talking about with URIs and linking. So old cataloging, flat file is often a word that's thrown around. It's basically a very plain Jane uh, you know, a description. But what's happened with linked data bit frame is it's taken that and it's exploded that into a three dimensional star. Each of the points of the star are part of uh, a registry or an authority file or um, any of the others, your local data. So all of this is really significant uh, because it's actually linking to not necessarily directly, but indirectly. We've seen this, if any of you have um, experienced or discussed the use of um, the Rotten Tomatoes rating that are in what we could put into our catalog now, that is how linked data works. We actually add a IMDB, the International Movie Database. There's an identifier for that. We put that URI uh, the code itself into a specific field with a subfield two for IMDB. And what the system does is it shows a relationship of Rotten Tomatoes in that, using that code and it's populated in Primo. So this is a, a kind of a different mindset. We have to think about how all of these are interacting. And then um, with the IMDB, and the Rotten Tomatoes or anything else that we want to populate um, is the fact that, that they are all using unique identifiers for this content. So it's not just libraries, but we want to interact with those things outside libraries. And this is what your relationships really are trying to push. So genres, thesaurus and registries, these are AKA, AKA points on that star. It is structured data fields uh, with uh, subfields and unique values. Um, this is the age of identifiers or curries. And so curry means compact URI expression. And so what the, this RDAPM, that is part of the curry. I'm gonna try and go, If you can see this, I hope you can see this. Can you see this? No, we can only see what's inside of your um, share screen box. So you would have to take this down and then bring up the other um, the other web browser that you have open. All right, well, we'll skip that. So what you need to do though, uh, is for this first link, you're going to, click on it, you will get a list of all the terms or values as they're really known as for RDAPM. From that, you will see on the very far right, there'll be uh, a curry list. The curry list is really divided into two parts, RDFPM colon, and then it has the code. So 1004 is the code I'm talking about. 
Again, a lot of this will be behind the scenes, but many of these terms that used to be in RDA um, now kind of give you the list from the RDA uh, registries. Uh, so it's kind of moved, it's actually become links data, it's been ex, uh, externalized. Some of these uh, terms list are still in RDA, but um, but they're up, but still what you need is, and what developers need is not in RDA. Um, there's kind of a relationship between the two though. Um, and so you can, developers can see this, sorry about that. So, so the new York, the URIs can be found in the new RDA toolkit. Um, and another example here is uh, the 385, which is a demographic for people who are interested uh, or the audience characteristics. Uh, most of these come from LCDGT, that is the preferred thesaurus that you're using. And so I've given you a, other two other links as well. And so these, both of these are uh, kind of examples of how this link data is going to work. Um, if you notice, even uh, the LC classification number has been given now a, a new identifier. How uh, locally devised numbers are going to be addressed still needs to be hashed out. So kind of more of an overview, there's explicit descriptions versus isness and aboutness. For a lot of these archival collections we're doing, uh, we typically have just piled all these subjects down uh, from the 600 to 610, 611, 630 and all that. Um, but for some of these, they're not really about um, that resource. They only contain those resources. So you have to really think about what is your archival collection about um, and rethink about where you want to include your data. So let's talk about the 385. Again, this is the audience characteristics. So this demographic will allow catalogers the ability to add a target audience for Cabo collections. Um, so you have to think about who would be interested in this. Uh, for some, most of them are going to be scholars, historians, and occasionally genealogists, depending on what it is. Uh, but you also, you have spe specific, collection specific, such as John C. Huxford papers has all of his manuscript scores. So musicologists would be interested in this. Um, most of his scores were band or piano, one or the other, because he was a pianist. But um, so there may be other uh, demographics that you can add. So you have to think about that uh, as you do these. So here's an example. I just, uh, this is not archival, but it, it kind of demonstrates what I'm talking about. So modern dance. Uh, for old cataloging, we simply put in the 300 that it contained the music. Uh, and sometimes that's sufficient because it's only giving you say one or two measures or something. It's not actually giving you full scores, but there are some that actually do have the complete piece used for teaching modern dance, so music examples. Um, that means that there's a new audience, not just dance teachers, but a different audience. This particular book also has physical, physical education teachers, that's their demographic. Um, but in the long run, collaborative pianists are the ones that actually need this book as well, because it does have selections of music for them to use for those who are uh, working in the dance studio. Um, so there are different ways of doing that. In our primo instance, audience facets pull from the 521 note as well as the five, uh, 385 field. So we can exploit this now even for archival collections. Archives Grid, they've actually been um, experimenting with this. Uh, this has the 351 in it as well, because I wanted to give you an idea of where uh, they're planning to, or where have they have shown it to fall within the description. Um, but you can see you have groups, you have two occupational groups, there are religious group, there's a gender group, so this resource is specific for women. It's also uh, specific for Washingtonians. 
All these come from the LCDGT, except the last one. The last one is not in LCDGT, but it's in LCSH, and that's herbalist. So this resource is specific to um, women herbalists that are also Wiccan. Uh, if you notice, though, this one is repeated. The reason for that is because they've not differentiated at this point between 385s and then the 386s. So this was created by women herbalists, but it, these are the people who, uh, who would be interested in it. So I think uh, Archives Grid does have a way to go, but at least it's something gives you an idea. There are other things too that you could add. So associated place, this is a new field for 370. We're currently not using it in Primo, uh, but you can still use a thesaurus. So here I've got our manuscript. One is two uh, handwritten receipts for bills of sale for slaves. Um, and so I've shown you that um, these into 370, um, United States and Baker County, Georgia, the both terms come from the National Authority file. So you're going to use what is established in a thesaurus. The ending, the subfield T, tells you when it was created. Um, so this is something really it's not new, but the field itself is new. Um, subfield S would be a beginning date, subfield T ending date, if that was appropriate. Um, if you've only got a single date, uh, an ending date, then you only use subfield T. The keep in mind though, this is not a subject, but this is where the resource was created. So you could put, if your resource, if your archival collection was created in Georgia, then you could put Georgia uh, as a demographic. So it could be useful in, our, in harvesting resources created in Georgia that maybe deal with um, other things such as the Civil War, and I'll get to that shortly. Time space for aggregates. Okay, so there were two bills of sales for uh, this manuscript collection. One was in 1837 and the second one was 1839. So the time span um, is really dealing with two different objects. All of our archival collections or most of them are like that. There are some instances that are not, but that is the case in this one. And so, an aggregate, it's two individual works or expressions issued together in a single work, not originally created together. So that fits our definition. Um, in the 046, you can put the subfield zero, uh, subfield O, it's not a zero. You put the first date and the subfield P, you put the second date. And you're using a, another set of rules, EDTF. Um, and so the extended time date format allows you to create a machine harvested code that uh, could be used in resources, uh, researching, and, I mean, searching. So your 388 also allows you to put the century for which these were created. Uh, best practices at this point, that you only use the dates when not known. But if you look at OCLC's bibliographic formats and standards, they do show using both. It makes more sense to use both because they can um, be used differently. For a long time, uh, the 388 did not have um, a, a registry that you could use, uh, but with best practices, they eventually, after that came out, they did finally show examples of LCSH which is the, probably the most common uh, OCLC edition they had. Time span though for specific events. So our current subject heading is United States History Civil War. Not very uh, conducive to putting it into a time span, but because you can use additional thesauri, you could use a fast heading, which would be American Civil War. So, and for some of the Georgia Historic newspapers, uh, we have put that, I have put that in there. Um, I need to go back and add some others, but I'm using the fast heading. Again, uh, this is kind of relatively new, 
um, and using specific thesauri, but you can see the ID is the World Cat Fast heading uh, identifier that's used at URI. Um, this could actually be useful in some kind of search mechanism, whether it's Primo or the next system we move to. There's also uh, the Library of Congress genre terms, the isness of a resource. So this moves some of your traditional 650s into more of a genre that this contains records, documents. So that's your um, that's your your term for archives. But it also has personal correspondences or business correspondence. It may have diaries or it may have a lot of ephemera personal narratives and so forth. Um, and I've given you just or a screenshot of how this works in Primo or looks in Primo. I've given you the identifier, this is LCGFT. And so um, they are all ways of actually pulling out and using uh, the isness as opposed to the subject. Uh, so here's another uh, example of a user experience. Um, I, I teach a class in the fall, it's a graduate research class, and uh, this assignment uh, that, that they're working on dealings with the library of catalog and facets. And so they're learning about what facets are and, and everything, uh, Boolean related. And so they were looking at not necessarily newspapers, but they were looking at um, the repetitive facade right here. And they wanted to know why there were multiple things for the same thing. And of course, for their assignment, what they chose was the ones that have the most and completely ignored everything else. So students are choosing to not necessarily look at everything. They do not know what ATT is, FAST, LCGFT, or LBG and RNR. So perhaps this is a usability study that needs to be performed uh, on how uh, patrons are actually approaching multiple headings like this, the redundancy. Teasing out of interest, content and relationships. So sometimes cataloging subunits, items and or components separately is really beneficial for getting your patrons into using resources or getting them to request things. Um, so 774 and 773 are used for some of those. I really was surprised that uh, bibliographic formats and standards is now using our cuneiform tablets collection as their example. Um, so that's, but this is kind of how it's constructed. And then a lot of the, the new RDA is all about reciprocity. And so a reciprocal uh, entry would be in your archival collection for this subunit. You would, in the bibliographic uh, level, put D so that it does show that association or that it is associated record. And so this is contained in the manifestation. Archival collections are considered manifestations. What it contains is works and expressions. And of course, manifestations as well. Um, so RDA 2020 is structured data of values and subfields and identifiers. So that's what all of this is done. The subfield W is probably going to take a more important role um, in the future for discovery systems in linking. It won't be necessarily the title, but the identifier that connects this to this or this to this. Serials and serial issues. Uh, these provide title access for known works. This is how you get interlibrary loan requests for some of these records. Uh, I know that we've had an increased uh, interlibrary loan request for some of the things that we've done, uh, but they also have title access. Uh, there are also loan serial issues that make uh, contain in folders that might be worthy of cataloging as a standalone or an analytic of some sort. An example of this was is a Playboy magazine that um, I do have in my collection. And the reason for that is because it has an eyewitness account of one of the early festivals from the 70s. 
um, he was invited to actually participate and then publish on it. I'm trying to get permission to digitize that one article, but uh, there are copyright issues uh, that don't allow it. Uh, I would need to contact the author instead of Playboy. Uh, <clears throat> but you could choose to, you know, to do the article or you can do uh, Playboy magazine in it, the whole issue because there are other things that, that might be um, of use to patrons such as interviews or whatever. But that uh, allowing more granularity than just a serial title. So if you do have a loan issue and we do have a couple, um, you can start adding subject headings uh, that are less broad. So you can actually bring out something or even a description, a table of contents, all that stuff. So that's also significant in actually getting people into that. Um, you can't do this for everything, obviously, um, but there may be instances that, again, it warrants actually a little more effort in description. Collocation is a big thing. So serial, serial issues, monographs uh, that you are teasing out of your archival collections, there are different ways of linking them together. Um, and so um, I've given you a, a UGA practice of adding a series for your collection and a series uh, in the 830 as well. I've given you also the alternative, um, the 962, 961, this is for our local uh, database. Um, you can also do a corporate body access, 710, which is the 953. This is Valdosta's practice. So you have a unique items. You actually add that 710, uh, and then for non-unique items, you would need to actually put the uh, put it in a local note. These are both viable options, but the problem with both is that they do need to have identifiers or URIs that would generate a URI in the future. And so this is where you really need to think about that for that 830 becoming a, uh, a local established authority record or because I'm NACO, I've been creating them in the National Authority file well, to create that identifier. So that's also something that needs to be kept in mind. Roles, um, so here's another one, adding a specific role for creators would provide the linking mechanism needed. Um, so 710, again, for publishers, um, this is a really important publisher, uh, believe it or not, uh, because uh, they're new, coming out of Italy, and but they're uh, doing some really interesting stuff. Um, but the problem is the publisher versus the four. The, a recent report, um, and I'm also, this is, there's a small bibliography in the back. Uh, it just will include this, this report from 2019. Um, it is the PCC tax uh, group for linked data. Uh, in this final report, uh, there are instances when a subfield zero would not be able to differentiate between what is in subfield A or what is in subfield B. That recommendation meant that uh, you should probably put the subfield four always and optionally put the subfield E. Um, the reason for that is that um, this is that RDF predicate issue. Um, there may be that the graph, which is the quad, as the context for the RDF expression, um, that might uh, fix this problem, but it still remains to be seen. Uh, but this is how you actually would do it uh, if you put both. Um, and so I've actually started putting both for everything that I do originally. Um, but there are other issues. Um, there is not a one-to-one -to, -one, uh, to subfield E terms in RDA to the subfield four list. So that would need to be rectified. Um, the subfield four list would also need to be expanded. So there's a lot of work still remaining about this. Then you have versions. Uh, this is another way of when we're dealing with specific uh, unique items in our special collections. Uh, a new field for 2018 for published and unpublished items. So you can use it for both. 
but it allows you to make a distinction between two items that are similar uh, but different. You may have such as a mock-up or prototype or a draft or a uh, published volume, one with plates and one without plates published in the same year, kind of an oopsie. Um, and uh, these display in Primo uh, in the same place edition statements play. So here's an example of, of a prototype version. Um, this is a DVD that uh, this is the mock-up before they actually um, created the one they sold. And there's at this point, there's really not um, a thesaurus that is useful for this type of thing, uh, but one could be had. Uh, you just have to look to see if if that thesaurus is usable for this field. But it can be controlled terms, so you can put a subfield to if it's appropriate, the URIs and as well. Uh, this may need also work. Um, and if you can think of anything else besides prototype version, please let me know. Here's your bibliography. And so I have the faceted vocabularies that um, would be useful for us to look at a little more. There's the more product, less product, that behemoth. Uh, so you need to look at that too to see where um, things really were and maybe how things need to be rethought. Uh, so I'm thinking that this uh, more product, less product could be 20 years later. This is how we need to change for a linked data environment. Another uh, opportunity for people to do a usability study or uh, something, something. Um, many of you have tenure and promotion publishing issues, so I'm not doing it, so you can jump in. Um, there's also the Archive Special Collections Links Data Report and also the PCC Task Group on Links Data Best Practices Final Report. All of those are really quite relevant. Um, all of all three of them, uh, other than more product, less product, all three of them really could be uh, useful in getting a handle on how things have changed with this linked data and semantic web mentality. Um, that's all I have. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm open. Thank you so much, Guy, for that informative presentation. If anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and raise, hit the raise your hand button at the bottom, and we can uh, uh, allow you to speak and ask your question or type them into the Q&A. So far, I am not seeing, let me check. Not seeing any, oh, okay, I see one. Let's see, one question. Shelly, go ahead with your question. Hi, this is Shelly Rogers from UWG. Guy, I want to ask you, I recently learned from our archivist that most researchers find the archival collections that we have at the folder level, which really surprised me. You know, the keywords they're looking for point them to a specific folder, and that's how they discover our collections. They're not actually discovering them for the most part by going to our list of finding aids on archive space. So um, I'm curious, I did have to miss uh, slide eight while my Wi-Fi went out. So I apologize if you covered this, but I'm curious if we don't cover things at a folder level because there's such massive quantity, you know, to describe out there. You know, I got that point from your initial slides. What can we do? You know, if our users are finding things at the folder level, you know, aren't we kind of stuck unless we actually do describe things at a folder level? Thank you. That's a, that's a very good question um, because uh, it's like I said, there should be some usability studies now that really look at how our users are approaching archives or discovering archives, particularly those that are off campus. Um, and so 
um, I think what you have to do is you have to assess. You have a brand new collection that's, that's come in, or maybe you have an older collection that was once in a backlog and you used the MLPL and you actually got it semi-processed or at least um, in a, a usable spot. Um, does this collection warrant really investment of time? Um, students, if they're just, you know, typing what is, um, what's in the folders without actually trying to assess what um, the real subject is about, or, you know, if you're just really doing the description uh, of what's in the folder, uh, I think a student could do that. Um, it really depends though. Um, for a lot of what I did for my collection, I actually worked at home. And so I, I did stuff at home. And then when it came time to populate them into archive, uh, Archon is what we had then, uh, we just copied and pasted into it and did the tweaking of the copy errors. Uh, we fixed a couple of those. Uh, so that kind of helps, but you know, that's a lot of time that's weekend time for me um, or nighttime. So it, just finding, I guess, the manpower to do it is, is a hurdle. Uh, but that's what you're going to have to do is you have to figure out which collection warrants a little more in depth. And that's what uh, the article really said is that because some of these collections uh, probably do not need the investment that we typically have been giving for them. Um, but you could actually have um, some of these collections that uh, are important. Okay, so for me, pagan studies is a new field of study. And so pretty much everything that I have uh, is beginning to be highly sought after. And so I've done a lot of authority work, which has not been done. I've actually started, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've been digitizing this. I've been reaching out to the leaders, uh, you know, can we digitize this? In some of these instances, you know, there's, uh, I have one issue of a periodical. Um, and so I, you know, I reached out, can we do this? And she said, yes. Oh my gosh, I did this when I was 16. I didn't think I'd ever see any again, but she looked at her parents' house, you know, she's 40 now, that she, there's no other copies except for this one. And so you really have to figure out what needs that extra step in actually getting something digitized, getting something described and so forth. It's, um, it's this is where, like I said, 20 years later, how has our users changed and what are their new expectations that in, nine, in 2004 might've been fine or 2005, but are not really sufficient at this point. Um, but the usability study is what's gonna drive convincing administrations that we do need a little more investment. And this is not just an archival description, it's cataloging in general. Uh, particularly as we, we continue to move for this linked data and trying to prep our records to work in the next system, you know, we've really, everything needs to be touched. Even um, Adam Schiff, everyone who probably knows who that is, he said, everything needs to be touched. Even if it's an automated process, everything needs to be touched. And so adding the subfield four is not really a big issue for existing records that already have a subfield E because that'll be the easiest automated process of, of adding it back. I mean, just if that subfield E is there, no subfield four is there, populate it. And so this is something that OCLC can do. Um, and they've already started doing that. They're, you know, for your dissertations, I don't know if you've noticed, but if you've cataloged dissertations correctly, they added that 655 for academic thesis. Hey, so, Jack. Um, yes. I just wanted to let you know, we did have one additional question before our session time runs out. Um, yep. Deborah, go ahead and ask your question. Yes, um, this, this has to do with the question that was just asked. George Chapman of NC State did a usability study on the parts of a finding aid. 
how long it took to do each part, and then how useful each part was in terms of uh, users being able to find the information they sought. And what they found was the inventory, the folder level inventory was by far and away the most useful part of the finding aid. And the, bio the biography was actually the least useful part used in finding the finding aid. So when we adapted that along with MPLP, what we did was cut way down on the arrangement, give the boxes to the students, have them go in and describe each folder. You cut down on the preservation work, but describe each folder. And um, your system can do the arrangement for you because it allows you to search to the folder level. It is not like extra time, you do not apply subject headings at the folder level, but you do use rich keywords. And we're finding in our car archives that rich keywords are more applicable if you're um, because they'll get you down to the folder level, whereas the subject heads will get you to the collection, but they won't get you into the content of the collection at the level that you can pull it and that the people can use it. They'll know that, yes, this is about slavery, but they need to know specifically this folder. So, it's there's a way to do that that is fast, but um, it does dispense with like arranging the collection into carefully into series. You just take the collection and go. And that is one way of applying MPLP and still getting what the users want, which is that inventory so they can find exactly what they want. That is fascinating, Deb. I really think that's interesting. It turns our work upside down, like we start from the bottom up instead of the top down. Thank you yes. for that. Yes, that's how we start. And then the top part is put on, the bottom part is put on by a student, the top part is put on by a staff member who has some cataloging experience because we share our because we share our finding aids. There needs to be um, standardized subject headings there, but for findability, the best source is rich keywords. In the practical application of archives. Thanks, Deborah, for, for that um, insightful comment. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, Guy, um, if you want to say a few last words, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, I just want to say that uh, following up on what Deborah said is uh, back for one of these slides, I talked about teasing out so if you've got actually something that would warrant teasing out cataloging as a monograph, such as a questionnaire that led to the publication of a book, you know, that's when you actually use that. Um, it's still going to point to your archival collection in the OPAT. So uh, it's, you're using it kind of a, a backdoor to the archival collection by putting that in there. Um, it's, it's a, I was going to say, we did have one additional question come in. I don't know if we have time to, to get to it. You see it in the chat from Lucy. Um, I have a note on this guy. Has anyone experimented with end user research in? Not that I'm aware of, uh, but it's another usability study we probably should be doing. Again, we should be looking at all the changes that are happening and what we've done with Primo, has it been useful? Uh, and there's plenty of this that anyone could do. 
And uh, for everyone that's listening, Lucy's question was, has anyone experimented with end users, researchers entering those rich keywords to describe folders or collections like Rotten Tomato reviews? So thank you, Lucy, for that question. Um, I see one more hand raised, Deborah. Um, if it's a quick question, we'll be able to, to answer it. Let me see. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say that Guy's, Guy has a collection. It's a really large collection on paganism and Wiccan, Wiccan. And what he has done is go deep into the boxes and catalog items within that collection. And by cataloging those items in our OPAC, um, we have gotten interlibrary loan request for items like a particular cereal that happens to be in that collection. So if the collection warrants it, cataloging within a collection can be very good. It's just most collections that would be an impossible thing to do. And what Guy has done is a labor of love with that level of cataloging. True. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Deborah, for your uh, comments once again. And I uh, wanna thank Guy for his presentation this morning. The Recording of this presentation will be available later and the slides will be immediately available on the conference platform on SCED. So thank you all so much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of the conference and the rest of your day. Bye.